Best Book Bits podcast brings you Matt Church, founder of Thought Leaders, leadership expert, global top 10 motivational speaker, and the author of 13 books, including one of his latest, Rise Up and Evolution in Leadership. Matt, thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me, Michael. What a pleasure. No worries. Now, for my audience who don't know who you are, I'm a massive fan of yours, by the way. I've uh, got some of your books handy here called Sell Your Thoughts, How to Earn a Million Dollars a Year as a Thought Leader. I found that in a used bookshop, uh, probably five years ago in Port Melbourne for 10 bucks and I thought you know what the sub head the subtitle oh ten dollars for a million dollars absolutely that's what I thought too how to make a million dollars a year for ten dollars and I thought I have to buy this book I have done a summary of it on online and uh, yeah it is amazing we'll jump into it soon but yeah take us back to your story for people that don't know you how did you sort of um, let's go back to your late teens what were you doing sort of after school and what was your first sort of job or what did you do studying? Mm, okay, let's do this as quick as possible. So um, I'm the fourth child of five. There are three brothers elder than me. My sister passed away with ALS at the age of 21, which is what the ice bucket challenge is about. Yeah. When I was 17, I uh, graded in a black belt in a martial art called Taekwondo, which is a Korean martial art. And got what I found was teaching others that martial art was a real joy. Now, I didn't realize you can, you know, make a living doing what you love. So I got a cadetship with an accounting firm, lasted nine months, um, and then just bailed as quick as possible. Went to university and moved towns and learnt. Uh, during that university, I got an op- that period of learning science and health is I had the opportunity to work for the Department of Health as a lecturer. I just interviewed and they said yes. And in under a year, I was fortunate enough to be the director of education, placing where all of the uh, lecturers would go. And I was teaching anatomy and physiology and all those sorts of things. But I have always had a love of teaching. So when I leave the country anytime anybody gets to, I went to Fiji recently, um, is when I leave the country in the customs declaration, they say, what's your occupation? I go, teacher. Now, I'm not a teacher. I don't have a deep ed. Um, but for me, I identify as one. And so my whole life was, how do I teach? And then I sort of figured out the, I was doing all these, these jobs for the Department of Education. So you'd go to Wollongong and lecture, you'd go to Dubbo and lecture, all these country towns around New South Wales. And this company called MLC, Len Lease, picked me up to do, uh, we used to send a, a health lecturer to work on their employee conferences, uh, which they were so ahead of their time. And they said, hey, listen, you're good. Can we just have you and none of the other people? And I went, no, nah, no, nah, we've got to spread it around, you know, government department, blah, blah, blah. They said, what's your salary? And I said, bah. They said, we'll match that. And all you have to do is eight weekends in a year. And I went, yeah, okay. And that created the space to then figure out what was this thing called corporate training? What was this thing called coaching, executive coaching? What What is a facilitator? What's a speaker? What are these people who write nonfiction books? What's the business model behind it? So Len Lease basically freed up my time. And for three or four years at the, under the age of 25, I actually got to obsess about the profession. I'm now 53, right, that I've been doing for close to 30 years, which is, you know, turn up to a conference and speak, go into an organization, run a workshop, a training workshop. And my whole life has evolved to the point where I sit now very comfortably in the place of, um, you know, encouraging leadership and teaching and writing on leadership. And I just, I love it. It's such a privilege. And, um, I also realized I didn't, I started businesses, did well, start and sold a few health and things like that. And then I realized managing others wasn't my, my joy. I can do it. I just don't love it. And so I wanted to kind of be free. And that's where I learned the practice model, which is the, the key thing we sort of distinguish in that book that you had in your hands there, which is um, all my books are free, by the way. They're all digitally free for people to download. So you just go to my website uh, there's no tricks uh, and you get a PDF or a Kindle version and I'm about to record them all in audio as well just as a thing. And, and fascinating thing about that is there's this guy called Chris Anderson who started the Wired magazines, not to be confused with Chris Anderson who's the TED guy. And he wrote a book called Free which just changed my world because it, it asked the question, what business are you in, right? And he was talking about Brazilian uh, jazz musicians who have their mu- their concerts pirated in the moment. So someone comes in, records their concert. I mean, they still use CDs there, right? Records the concert, comes out, and then bootlegs the CDs. So the band makes no money. 
and how the the Brazilian um, jazz artists realised they were in the business of concerts, not the business of music. So they started using the bootleggers as their marketers. And before you knew it, um, they've got more people turning up to their events because they just did a 50-50 distribution deal with the people who were crooks and stealing their music. And he sort of said, what would you do if your business became free? If, if the thing that you charge for became free, what's your competitive advantage? And I realized I'm not in the idea business. I'm in the experience business, which is why my books are free, but my experiences aren't. Yeah, well said. I'm still trying to work it out. And one of your um, one of your taglines, which I really love, you talk about helping clever people be commercially smart. Now, I've, I'm up to 1,000 free book summaries in video, written, and audio format. I've been doing that for... You know, offline for 13 years, online for six years, and I don't make any money from it. I actually lose money, and people think it's a business. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's not even a business. It's just a hobby. Um, but yeah, I'm still trying to work it out myself, so I'm happy to sort of deep dive into that. But yeah, thank you. I, I visited your website the other day. The books are for free, and you can literally download all your knowledge. And to touch on it, what was your first book 25 years ago? What was the, your, your, your first? Yeah, what, what was that? book you can't get anymore and you never be a bit hidden around on a table here it's called mastering personal fitness training but so what happened is i went over to la before there were personal trainers in australia and i ran in i, I heard about two guys a guy called douglas brooks and a guy called dodd trump and they were in la being personal trainers to the stars and i went what the hell is this thing and then I found these private studios opening up in los angeles and now we call them f45s we call them systems all crossfit and none of this was happening and um i got the opportunity to come back and open up one um and run a prototype and loved it uh, but then realized that i didn't want to be in in that business so my very first book is it should have been called how to make money as a personal trainer and it's so i've always been interested in how do people because making money is about creating value so i'm more interested in creating value than i am in making money but I've got no problem with money. So I'm if, and it's a really simple process. Experts, the people who write books or who do podcasts and things like that, what you generally have is a deep knowledge about something. So expertise doesn't always equate to empathy. And I have found, and certainly the things we teach and in all of our programs, is that empathy is your commercial competitive advantage. If you understand my needs and what you're offering matches them, boom, like we're good to go. Um, the second thing I reckon, and this goes to you, not that that's what this conversation is necessarily about, but you can do whatever you like, it's your show, is quite often the thing you're doing specifically is not the thing you end up making money out of. Um, but when you end up making money, you can see the through line that gives you like the DNA, if you like, of why, what, like, so doing book summaries for 13 years. Okay. Can you make money doing that? Look, maybe. What is it actually about? And when we ask that question, we get different answers. So a good example is if you go to any business school in the world and they run an innovation course, they'll put up a picture of a drill and the professor will ask the students some questions. So she'll say, uh, oh, drills, what's your business? And people go hardware, construction, customer service, and she'll go it until someone goes making holes. And if someone comes up with a better way of making holes, stop selling drills. And this is how we innovate in times of uncertainty. So it, that concept um, is what I'm talking about here, which is like you're doing book reviews and book summaries. Okay, so that's the stuff. What's the meaning? And it's probably um, making it easier. Like your whole your whole premise seems to be, I'm just going to get the best bits because you don't have time to read, so I'm going to do it for you. So you've got this premise or the meaning is ease. And I go, what's that actually about? And it's about knowledge access. So that could be one through line. And we go, okay, so now how can we make money through knowledge access? And then we drill down and the book summaries then become almost the the bonus or, yeah. or the special source. Yeah, I, I guess I wasn't completely truthful. The actual book summary part is it's not a business but behind the scenes i work with authors and publishers and all that stuff as well so that's the actual that's that's the business behind yeah yeah sorry which i'm not going to get on to now because it's a private business and it's a private practice and yeah that's one of the things about being a, a thought leader and understanding that knowledge and expertise and adding value and empathy so i like how you broke that down as well um yeah what what did you do after the fitness thing so in in the mid 90s through that what was your sort of second and second yeah
they had the Lend Lease Foundation, which was funding employee engagement before that was even a word, um, corporate health programs before that was an idea. And what happens over time is uh, the thing you think you're an expert in morphs, just like I was talking, you know, through your hypothetical example. So wellness is a subset of performance and stress is a subset of performance. And so I very quickly found myself in the performance space and then performance is a subset of leadership. And so I've gone from wellness to performance to leadership as my categories of expertise over the decades. And my business model is very simple. Write a book, give away a thousand of them, handwritten, signed ones, and that generates the million dollar revenue that's sort of promised in those books. And um, it's, it's the idea that you've got to have your solution set ready to go, but it's like leadership retreats for me. It's things like uh, leadership days, um, working with senior leadership teams. These are all, you know, Department of Education has me working with school principals at the moment about um, principalship, which is what does leadership look like when you're leading learning? And uh, they're, they're in a huge, uh, you know, post-COVID, a really tough environment to be a leader because you've got a whole heap of stakeholder expectations like parents now returning kids to school have medical concerns and heightened levels of anxiety. So they're leading in very volatile environments. So yeah. that's kind of the through path from a 20-year-old to a 50-year-old. Um, no, I get it. Um, my wife's been in the education space for over a decade and understand the people don't understand principles. You might run 1,500 students, 3,000 parents and 100 teachers and 100 teachers partners. You're dealing with thousands of pounds, thousands of people. So very, very stressful job. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, I love to, I uh, quickly sped read some of your books, The Chemistry of Success and Adrenaline Junkies as well, some of the early ones. That was that was really cool info and I loved how you stacked it all and, uh, and made sense from that as well. But um, yeah, talk about how Thought Leaders uh, started in the early 2000s. Where did that idea come from and uh, what it's grown into now? Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, no, at the time we're recording this, Russia, Ukraine, you know, I don't know when people will be listening to it, but that's our current context flooding in you know, Brisbane down through to Sydney. Um, so in 1997, I'm in Hong Kong. I'm running a program for Reebok. Uh, so they were, like, they were shooting and they were funded. They were pre-Nike. They were very big in the health and fitness industry. And they, um, they used to run educational programs. So I'm in Hong Kong for about six weeks and it's at the handover of Hong Kong where effectively the British were handing it back to China and it was on a 50-year integration plan. And I had this just strong awareness of the geopolitical challenges between capitalism and communism, between you know democracy and socialism. And I was sort of heavily in the environment while it was happening. It was all in the news. And I, I got this very strong, almost prophetic vision or prescient feeling that I've come to re- realize it just ran my life since then, which was whenever you're beholden to a system, you're stuffed. You know, how, what's, what's agency look like for you? So if agency to, might look like financial freedom. Agency is, you know, being able to do what you want when you want and no one to stop. And I was trained in what's called classical libertarianism, which is, you know, this, you know, I'm sure lots of people understand what it is. And the most famous libertarian author is Anne Rand with her books, Atlas Shrugged, which gives a bit of a dystopian view of, of um, libertarianism. But the, a classical libertarian says, you do what you want, I'll do what I want, as long as neither of us stuff up what each other wants. So the basic, that's the operating agreement, you know, as opposed to sort of conservatives and like liberals and progressives and uh, so a libertarian sits almost like as a fulcrum between those Um, and I don't believe in either of those political systems but being trained in that way in Hong Kong watching communism take over and democratic imperialism leave I just was caught in this bull of bays that when you you think of the world we're in right now you go well you know we're still we're still dealing with these challenges um so in that environment, I went, I'm going to make it my life's work to be free of system, systemic pressure. And that what I want to do is I, I have been doing that, I kind of decided. And I said, I've got a bit more work to do. I reckon I can help a whole bunch of people be free. And so this idea of freedom, you know, liberty and emancipation, where you have total agency and total sovereignty over your life and you get to do work you love with people you like the way you want. I just go, that just sounds like the best thing in the world. And I said, so how 
lot of ways you could do that. You could go to become meditators and live on mountains. You could become detached to the – there's things you could do, become entrepreneurs. And I said, well, I don't know any of that, but I know how to make money sharing ideas. And it doesn't take a lot of days a year to do it. And if you put your money into property, <laughs> then you can stop working at some point because you've taken the income – and instead of building businesses that you sell, which very few people do, it's a bit of a myth. Um, not to say you can't, it's just very few people do. And you're meant to start, grow and exit a business for a lot of like figures. And I did okay with a couple of my businesses I sold, but I just ended up in management structures doing Monday meetings. And I go, this is not what I want. I love teaching. And so um, I was able to teach that model. And that model, which is based on freedom, then became what Thought Leaders is about and what the business school is about. And it's now, you know, 20 plus years on uh, through COVID, it went from an in-person sort of event company to an online educational company. And that two to three year pivot is the best thing we've ever done. We've now got people like it's it's now back to pre-COVID levels as an enterprise and um and this ability to scale is now bigger than it's ever been before. And that's with a new CEO called Lisa O'Neill, based out, basically transformed the business. She's an author of seven books herself. Um, so she sort of understood the power of custom intimacy. She sort of understood how to build team um, at it. And she really builds teams on cultures of care. Um, and because what we're doing is anti, anti-system, it's very non-patriarchal and everyone here is male, female and that. It's not. It's about top down versus bottom up. And uh, so she's built it like a school. So something that, like, that I dig uh, where you've got lots of stakeholders, lots of collaborations, not a triangle with one person at the top. And that's created massive opportunity and growth for us. So that's the thought leader story, which is a 20 odd year story. But it's basically built around my passion to teach and to be free and to help other people use teaching as a way of becoming free. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. And it, it makes sense coming back to your original values of what, what you wanted to do. And yeah, everyone that you've taught underneath that uh, for the last 20 years is fantastic. And obviously, that's where the books come through as well. But for the listeners out there that are thinking, what is a thought leader? You define uh, thought leadership is thinking in action. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of the difference between a practice and what a business is and how this is building a profitable practice for people versus, you know, essentially setting up your own business that a lot of people will either fail at or uh, won't sell it. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, building a practice versus a business? Yeah, so you could think of it like a doctor, right? Like a let's say a doctor is a surgeon and she performs, you know, five surgeries a week. Her whole practice is basically just keep the surgeon doing surgery. And so a practice is about a person trading time and skill for money, which is what classic business advice would tell you not to do. So it's a bit counterintuitive to an accountant because an accountant would go, no, no, take your name off the door, you know, no, 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 like Michael Gerber's E-Myth. I'm sure it's one of the books you've reviewed over your yeah. years. Great book, but it's all about if people are the problem, systems are the solution. And that's absolutely true if you're trying to start, grow and exit a business. But if you're trying to do a labor of love, like imagine you were financially free and I said, now what are you going to do? You're not going to play golf. You're going to go, well, I just want to do work I want. Like, and I want to do it the way I want, with people I want. I, we don't want to stop working. The only time we want to stop working is if we're in some factory grind. And I get it's a privilege that very few people, most people have a job, um, very few people um, have a career, and even fewer people have a vocation. But the, the, the idea that you don't need a vacation um, vocation, I think is super, super true of the practice model. So the practice model is you sell your time 50 to 200 days, uh, you sell them between five and 15,000 a day, and what you can end up with is half to one and a half million with one or maybe two staff. And the interesting thing is uh, thousands of people have done that. It's not for everybody. Yeah. You've got to have an idea and you've got to be willing to teach. And I use the word teach, but by teach, I mean speak at conferences. I mean write and publish books and podcasts. I mean run workshops for 30 people. Uh, I mean, mentor senior leaders, you know, or whatever it be. And sometimes there's professional people like um, public figures, like a Tony Robbins type, like there's people doing that in, in our, through the model. And sometimes professional like me, where I go into organizations and work on leadership. Um, uh, I'm not a public figure. You can't buy tickets to, to like for me to do a thing um, because 
I'm just not in the business of $150 tickets. I'm, I'm in the business of going in and doing a day for an organization or 12 days or whatever it might be. So lots of choices. Uh, that um, yeah. All my books are like jelly beans. Yeah, and just, just to... <laughs> and just to just to break it down as well, the the one thing that I really resonated in how you put put it down to the three M models, and I'll just I'll read just a little bit of it. You talk about message, the clarification and packaging of your IP, which is your intellectual property, and that's what you know. And then the second model is your market. So who values what? Uh, what you mean by that is the audience that your that your target to sell your IP. So it's message first, market second and then third you talk about the method and how you share that and that's delivering your mechanism via the ip do you want to expand on that a little bit the message market and method and there's so many different combinations of that so that's where it really got me yeah i I really like how you put that together what a lot of people do is they go i'm going to coach someone on communication skills and I said, I'm going to coach middle-level corporate leaders on communication skills. And what they've done is they've locked in and gone, That's and they call it a business. They go, that's going to be my business as a coaching business. And I'm like, you might be wrong because what you might end up wanting to do is train um, frontline personnel on enthusiasm. And you don't know that because at the beginning you think I'm just going to you, – you just – You only go down the pathways and the routes that seem obvious and apparent to you. But if you treat that almost like experimental design, so what's a message that I could take to a market in a different way and you give yourself the freedom to spin those combinations, you end up with sort of two things. You end up with what Eric Rees called minimum, like he wrote a book called The Lean Startup. Uh, the lean organization. I reckon you might have done it in one of your thousands if I you have, haven't. Yeah, it's yeah. based well, Tim, yeah, Ryan and Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. They work on the same idea, which is don't don't make it too hard until you know whether people want to do it. And this is a concept called minimum viable product. So the idea is is don't design a full coaching business with a massive website and all of that sort of stuff. Just take it out and see if anyone wants to buy it. And if they want to buy it, we can then worry about those other things. And we sort of say if it's just 10,000 a month, let's get serious about it. So we run that idea of the what we call the cluster strategy, the message market method. We run it as a frame that enables you to run experiments, commercial experiments where you have a hypothesis. I reckon that this idea is going to be interesting to these people if I deliver it in this way. And those three things are like circles, like a Venn diagram, but they're like tumblers in a safe and you just keep changing the message and the market and the method. And all of a sudden, some of them click. But what most people do is they lock one in and they go, well, is it not working? And I go, because no one wants it. So, or because, you you know, or it's not differentiated in some way. So giving yourself the freedom to go, you're michaelknight.com, who happens to be working on this project at the moment, means you can fail that project and launch another one. Fail that experiment and launch another one. And you're not a failed business person. You're, you're a scientist who's running experiments in the commercial field. And that flip gives because the whole thing we know is Matt Church and Michael Knight doesn't change. But what you are interested in can change. And so you'll notice my morphing from health to performance to leadership over the decades has been and all all of my books I realize are on leadership is just the health ones were on personal leadership. The performance ones were on like results, success, pressure leadership. And the more recent ones are around the dynamic of impact and influence around those around you. So I can see that thread, but I didn't know it 30 years ago. The only thing I know is I look at a bunch of experiments that worked and then you can actually see a through line from those experiments. And and everyone wants that before they start. And I go, forget about it, just start. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of run new experiments along the way. So that's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because people are like, no, you've got to plan. You've got to, I'm like, you plan, but plan by having enough for someone to say yes. And if someone says yes and buys it, and then you go, okay, let's now double down on that if it's working. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. And one of the notes I took from that was the minimal viable product known as the MVP. And if you can get someone to say yes to something small, like okay, your minimal viable product, you can scale that. And then you can find it, okay, who's my target market? And I like I said about the scientists, we're all got that type A personality, OCD, ADD of that 
I'm a scientist, I'm a research scientist by nature. I like data. I, I like to figure things out. Um, and I'm sure you're the same too. Any author that's done multiple books can, <laughs> you're definitely a scientist. I want to sort of switch gears and, and go to something else. Um, one of the things I loved about the book, and I, I still use it daily, and I, I talk to a lot of people about it, it's called The Evolution of Sales. And you're right in the book, and I'll just refresh your mind. It's called Sales 101. It's basically about selling techniques. It's, it becomes a numbers game. See enough people and get to get good enough at the technique and people will buy what you have to sell. That's Sales 101. Sales 201 is basically about relationship selling. 301, it's about diagnostic selling, ask enough questions and understand the people's buying criteria and you create a proposition that gets you the business. But Sales 401, this is where I really sort of, I I was sold on Sales 401. Uh, it's about authority selling. You know something and others might just have a need. You've already nailed a solution for it. And it's about you disclosing your expertise first and asserting a level of knowledge on how to fix key issues that people might be experienced rather than assessing their level of need and creating a proposal, which is diagnostic selling. The principle behind authority selling is I know what's going on and can help you with that. I just want you to sort of expand on that. But I really love that. You put that in the book. Um, and yeah, I sort of bought that hook on sinker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we've just written a whole new book uh, called so Think, Sell, Deliver is goes three modes, message market method. Yep. So we've done a book called Think, which is the pink one. We've got a green one called Sell, which is going to be uploaded uh, to the side in about two months. And we're working on Deliver right now to complete the trilogy, which fits on that Venn diagram. So they're like the green book you've read plus the pink, the, the light green and the, the blue one. Um and in the cell book, we take that idea next level. So that was written, what, 12, 15 years ago? Yeah. And it's the – but if you understand the whole classical libertarian piece, I loathe being sold to, but I love buying. And so when I'm with a good salesperson, they're facilitating my buying decisions. And the difference is – and Seth Godin talked about this in one of his seminal works called Permission Marketing, and I'm sure you've done a bunch of Seth's books. Yeah. And – and Seth, um, it's basically the transfer of power where I go, you have the power, Michael, to buy this. I don't have the power to convince you to buy it. So it's deeply respectful. It, it sounds a little arrogant, like I know something, but it's actually really humble. I don't know everything, but I know this. And so my energy with it is like, hey, I've got this and I love to help these people and if that's you, let's dance. So what happens is our content marketing, when you're an authority, your content marketing is your primary business development vehicle, which is so useful in the world of social media and blogging and posting and all the things and podcasting because what you get to do is you get to bring quality. You're not, there's nothing behind the content gate. You put your content on the front because you're selling the experience, not the content. Right? So no content gate. Put your content like free available to people so that what they start doing is they start going, you actually do know that stuff. Um, and I would love you to come and create an experience with us and we'll pay you for the experience. So, um, okay, so when you step in your authority, what ends up happening is you're not right for everybody, but you are right for the people you know really, really well. And it's also price no longer becomes a problem. So you're so established in the conviction of your value. So you have conviction of your value that I don't need to convince you to give me your money you know, to give me your money. I just go, no, no, no. I know my value. Price is never an issue. And so there's a beautiful humility with conviction, which I th I love. I love that quiet confidence of certainty that you see it in legal and medical professionals, don't you, where they just go, no, I know this and I know exactly how to do it. And if you'd like some help, I'm, I'd love to help you. I'm free next Thursday. You know, and you just booked in and you're done, right? Well, where it comes from, I guess it, it, I've always said, you know, confidence comes with competence. So the more competent you are at something, the more confident you're going to come across. And uh, I've got experience selling uh, luxury Mercedes-Benz vehicles for a, a number of number of years. And, you know, we don't even, we don't sell the car because the brand does that and the slogan's the best or nothing and, and all we're doing is facilitating the purchase we're not even selling the customer we're literally just facilitating the purchase what advice would you give people that are starting into the profession of selling their thoughts as a leader and they might not have that competence to ask for high ticket pricing 
to to go out there and do? What would be the early things he would say? Let's say they've got the value proposition done, they've got all the stuff, they've got really good knowledge, but they're just having that hard line of asking the hard questions when it comes to, you know, packaging up and delivering that on a consultation call, asking for the money back or asking for the business. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the process is very much about linking expertise through empathy, which we've talked about already. Yep. And you could imagine problems exist at levels or like first order, second, third order. So without even knowing that, you just get this idea of like there's a problem we all agree on, that's first order. There's a problem that I don't want to talk about. It's a bit personal. Let's call that second order. And there's a problem that I didn't even know was the underlying issue that's third order. So what most exports do is they sell the third order because they know the underlying issue. And so they walk out and go, this underlying issue is what you need to fix. You need to fix this underlying issue. And so what the compassion and empathy does, it goes, yeah, hang on a sec. Just wind it back a little bit, Clever Clogs. What are they talking about? So if you had a bunch of small business owners, they go, man, how tough is it to keep the doors open? I can't get staff. I can't take a holiday and cash flow is killing me. So that's like first order problem set. And you might be someone who believes that um, business owners should be building wealth independent of their business. And so your coaching service is called, you know, take home, not turnover. And your point of difference is that focusing on turnovers are furphy. You don't want to do that. Focus on how much you're taking out of your business. So that could be your proposition, right? Which is like third order problem. Yeah. True, but they don't want to talk about it. They can't get the staff to come and work in their cafe on Thursday. So they're down in first order problems and you're talking third order problems. Yeah. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. It's just it's not relatable. So most people who are information experts are a little bit passionate. They're a little bit of an expert, as in that's the whole point. They know their thing so deeply that they almost are unable to, I, I find the phrase dumb it down very insulting, um, but they're unable to smarten it down to the point where it's accessible for someone who's just dealing with a lot of stuff at the moment. And so they've got their head in their expertise. I, at the phrase is not very, very classy, but they've got their head up their expertise. And what they actually need to do is get their head into other people's worlds. And we, we all know that, you know, really good customer value to require you to know your customer and their needs and you've got to have a massive compassion and a lot of the businesses that succeed succeed because someone goes no i was that customer and i didn't like the way the business was operated so i didn't like taxis for example and i was catching taxis so i started uber or whatever it might be that people do um so i guess that's my first step you the thing you're fixing is true but you've got to go back with empathy and it's called a compassionate concession talk about this not that no, you nailed it. Yeah, no, you you absolutely nailed it. And um, I hate getting like cold emails regarding, hey, you need to fix your website SEO. Just send a two line email saying, who's got time for websites or SEO? Here's my link. Book in a fifteen minute call. I'll tell you if I can add value or not. Like I would actually click on the link and book in a call instead of here's my price in da 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 da. And that's just a small example of some of the shit people are peddling out there without even asking the consultative question: is what are you struggling with? It's disrespectful. Yeah. It's disrespectful. So if you have a value called respect, don't let anyone tell you that making money is about gaming the system. Like it's so that's so nineteen eighties, and people are way too sophisticated now. Um, this is why influencers have, have come up as an opportunity because people are going to go, show me what you got. If I like it and I trust it, I'll follow it and I'll buy the stuff you recommend. Um, you can see the same strategy operating in whether it's gym equipment or fitness clothing or whatever it might be that people are, are into. Um, so influence makes total sense because we've got a loss of trust for people who we think don't have our best interests in mind. And yeah. so now what happens is we all want to check it out ourselves. I'll check you out. I'll make the decision whether you're worth doing something with. You've done it with me. Like I don't want you as a guest on this series if – I don't like your stuff. And so everyone you've interviewed, you've liked it, you've invested time, you've got into it. And so what ends up happening is there's a like an authentic, almost like relational capital that, that makes this work between you and I because we're good faith with each other. Every time you mention a part of the book, I go, man, he's actually read it. Do you, do you get that, that that investment is like it's powerful stuff and this is the – 
Yeah, well, your book is basically the reason why I'm doing the podcast as well. Like, um, getting back to your martial arts experience, I like how you broke it down in the book on, um, you know, chapter seven, you talk about the white belt, stage one, which is decisions. And you even give a good definition of decisions. So you talk about, you know, the word break it down, decide. Side means to kill, and decide literally means to kill off alternatives. Can you talk about sort of the st- stage one and, and those people like myself making those decisions to become a thought leader and how they can, you know, work with it, who they want to, when they want to, and basically selling your knowledge as an expertise? What are some of the, the first tips you would get apart from doing $10,000 a month, which is the first sort of financial uh, ladder on there? Yeah, look, the, the, with the sharing of information, it can be done three ways. Um, and you learn this in law, right? It can be done through, um, through declaration, it can be done through instruction, and it can be done through questioning. And so we could almost casually call them tell, show, ask. Which one of them are you better at? Are you a better teller? Because you might as well be a speaker. Are you a better shower? Because you might as well be a trainer. And a, or are you a better asker? Because you might as well be a coach. So the first thing I do is I go, do you? what is your style? So I'm a teller. And over the years, I've worked on my show and my ask. And now I turn up commercially more ask show than I do tell, which is just over the years, you know, that, that's a natural progression, I think, as well. So first thing is just sort of get your style. And then you'll see that we link up, you know, speaking and authoring. And we define authoring as way more than books. Um, so podcast is authoring. Uh, so speaker, author are the tells. Trainer, mentor are the shows. Uh, facilitator, coach are the asks. And we, we suggest that you just stay in your strength for a minute. But of all of them, the easiest one to do, we, we say to some people, if you're not sure what it is you know, so you, you don't know nothing, if you don't have a list of people to reach out so you don't know anybody, and you haven't done this before, so you have no experience, what should you do? And this I, I, this can come across a little insulting to people who spend a lot of time certifying as coaches. So I'm going to need to qualify this in a minute. So if everyone will just give me a little bit of grace. So this is a two-part answer, right? So the first part is if you don't know anyone, you don't know anything, and you're not sure how to get started, I say coach. Because in every conversation you have with a client, what you do is you develop intellectual property. So coach intentionally and just be of service to someone. So what's a group of someones that you'd love to hang out with and set yourself up as someone who coaches them? Coach, but what I would like everybody to do is not learn how to coach. You should do that at some point, but rather don't be the world's best coach. Be someone who's good enough at coaching around a thing that they really know. So, for example, in your case, you could easily, and I'm sure you do it in your business model, you could coach IP out of people <laughs> into the form of books because, you know, because producing books is one thing, but getting the concepts out and documenting is another. Yeah. Now, you do know that, so you actually would mentor people, but the, the possibilities, you go, well, I know a bit about books. I've read a lot of books. I'm really into books. Um, I'm going to coach people to get their ideas out in print. And you go, here we go. So I go, great, find people who want to write books and offer a coaching package to them which unpacks their ideas. Um, that's not the publishing solution. It's just three or five grand for a number of conversations where you take them through a process around what they know and codifying it a little bit. You do a bit of transcription, get a little bit of otter going, get them on some sort of Scrivener word count gamification where they've got to send 500 words a day to you. I'm sure you're doing all of these things. And before you know it, you're now coaching experts to publish nonfiction books. That's a good idea. I'm not doing that. I'm not. It's a, it's 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 another one. I, I I do coach people behind the scenes, and I love it. Um, I just love downloading my knowledge onto them, and I do uh, consulting with authors behind the scenes. But yeah, I that's I haven't thought about that one. I'm going to put that one into practice. Keep going. Yeah, sorry. Well, the thing the thing is that um, what's critical is that the price point is around five grand. And people go, no, 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 you don't understand the commodity pricing of what I'm doing. It's $250 an hour for an executive coach. I go, look, I don't care if you're selling, you know, 50 sessions, but just start doing $5,000 transactions, not $250 transactions. And then start working the, the ratio of give-get to the point where you feel confident and have conviction around your exchange of value. Um, 
So th- they're the early things that I start telling people. Yeah. Get, get into your tell show ask. Coaching's generally easy. Start selling a $5,000 coaching package because all we need to do is get two of them across the line every month and you've started. And the reason why this matters is we're trying to get, in physics, there's this uh, hypothetical experiment called perpetual motion machines. So if you've ever seen those Newton's balls, which are those metal marbles that you bang one end of and they move with kinetic energy or that duck that goes down and comes back up again and looks like a beaker. There's one of them on the Ted Lasso episodes where he's um, working with the psychologist. They're an attempt to be perpetual motion. So the idea is one little bit of energy and they just keep going forever. Now, they don't because of friction and atmosphere and this is the way physics works. Um, It has this experiment where it's realising that we can't actually create a perpetual motion machine unless it was in a vacuum. Uh, That's about all I remember from high school physics. If you can get three of these ideas, like the one we just talked about plus another two, where they cross-refer each other, then what you end up with is you end up with a perpetual business development machine. So just like the, the, the mythical sort of something that keeps going forever, you, you move from having to push yourself out into the world, look at me, please buy my stuff. You actually move into a new dynamic where people start beating a path to your door because of positioning. Because another definition of a thought leader is an expert knows something, but a thought leader is someone who's known for knowing something. And that tipping point where position and reputation means that you're fielding inquiries, means that you can be a surgeon who does surgery but doesn't have to put up a billboard and say, come and get brain surgery with me, right? Mm. Because brain surgeons don't advertise on billboards. They use a simple principle, get good, get known, right, and do good work. And so that's kind of the ethos that sits behind the practice model and would be my answer, I guess, for someone who's starting out. Um, And then the other thing is you don't have to give up your day job. You can do this while doing other things. So it's not an all or nothing proposition to get started. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for explaining that. And especially the last thing, yeah, you don't have to give up your day job while you're working um, on your thought leader practice ship till it gets to the point where it goes over. Um, it doesn't make sense to continue the day job. But just speaking of brain surgeons, I recently had to go see a specialist and uh, I'm not going to tell you what I had to get done, but I've got surgery booked in. And this is something that you don't normally think about, but the doctor's like, you need to go see this person who's a specialist in that particular area had no idea who he was, where he was, went there. Turns out he does these procedures daily. He's number one expert in the state on this particular thing. Doesn't advertise, you wouldn't know who he was, and he's just an expert on that one particular thing. But all the GPs know who he is, and they send all the work to him. So, And this is the game we're trying to get to, and it's basically if you need help with X, you have to talk to person Y. And so what you want to do is you've got to figure out what the X is and then you're the Y. You know what I mean? It's like, so if you want help with blah, you have to talk to Y. So for me, for example, is in, in our little experience, I go, if you want help understanding all of the books and the best bits on them, then you have to talk to Michael. Um, or if you're an author and you want to sort of talk to someone who bothers to invest in understanding your books to create a good podcast, talk to Michael. So can you see there's versions of that? But your reputation of how you're running this podcast then becomes something. I go, no, no, Michael Knight, best book bits, unreal. Go talk to him. Well, one of my ideas, yeah, one of my biggest things is, I know we run out of time, so we'll wrap it up soon, is to educate, you know, a billion people on the in the world. And how do I do that? I want to do, you know, 10,000 of the best book bits summarized so people can get free knowledge. And once someone gets to an understanding of the ignorance goes a little bit backwards and the knowledge goes forward, they can start making those appropriate decisions on their lives. So we're going through that humanity phase. Anyway, I'm not going to deep dive into that. But Matt, I really want to jump into Rise Up, but we're going to run out of time. Uh, so I've got so so many notes. So yeah, for sure, definitely. Um, I know you've you've got, you've got any more books coming out in the future yourself, or are you, are you writing any at the moment? I'm working on book 14, which is called The Leadership Landscape. That's it over my shoulder there. So I've commissioned an artist. Uh, so it's this it's this metaphoric land, and leaders go to these locations and conversations are facilitated so it's a picture book on leadership full of questions and the idea is that people go into you know the you know the high performance center they go into the bridge of forgiveness they go into the mountain monastery they end up in the in the uh, school of the chiefs and they they go into each of these locations and get to 
use that as a metaphoric lens for how they're going to be as leaders. So I really love the idea that I've done a lot of content books full of word count. What I'm going to do is a context book um, that's going to deeply align with my professional work, which is I don't want to tell people what to do. I want to sit with them while they discover what works best for them. Um, I'm just really, I really feel strongly that um, books are great, but the reason you're, what you do exists is, is it's hard to get across them all, isn't it? How many books published all the time? And, and it's actually not what you read that makes a difference. It's what you do with what you read, right, yep. which is the other reason why your work matters. And um, so, yeah, this new book, The Leadership Landscape, uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm trying to resist the habit of typing 10,000 words, 10,000 words, 10,000 words, and, and that's putting a lot of pressure on the 150 words at each location. So I'm actually loving that, and um, so that's my new one. No, awesome, yeah. And uh, I just honestly want to say a big thank you for the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being the leader and you know shining the light on other people's paths as well because at the end of the day, we, we don't have the time to spend 10, 20 years trying to understand all this stuff, just go out, go to Matt Church's website, go to his free resources, download his books, and it's all free. And at the end of the day, uh, if you want to be a thought leader, speaker, trainer, coach, facilitator, um, you can do it. So, yeah, just want to say a big thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for being a guest on Best Book Bits, and uh, we'll get you back in the future as well. So, Matthew, thank you for your time, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Done.